All right. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, um, I want you to turn to two places, actually. Um, the, first of all, to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. So we're in the Gospel section of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So the second book of the New Testament, Mark chapter 11. And I'm going to read uh, verse 12 and following. That will also be in the screen above me, that passage. But one passage is not on the screen. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there now. So keep your finger in Mark chapter 11. And I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 7. This morning, we're going to be looking at a very, uh, in, in many ways, simple, but very profound and important teaching of Jesus. How um, in the life of the Christian, faith is always to translate into a genuine life that is lived for Christ. Jesus makes this point time and time and time again. And the reason why he does that is because he realizes that it is a default position, especially of the Christian, to uh, allow a, a certain level of disconnect between faith and life. But the Bible never allows that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill that out here uh, this morning. So first of all, Matthew chapter 7. I want to begin reading at verse uh, 13. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter, says Jesus, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from uh, thorn bushes? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Um, this teaching is also reflected by Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he basically says, the, the branch that remains fused to the vine will grow and it will bear fruit. But when the branch detaches itself from the vine and no longer receives sustenance from the vine, then the branch no longer bears fruit, and eventually it's just cut down and thrown into the fire. So, so Jesus' words are, are uh, very clear and very forceful. Now, Mark chapter 11, and I want to begin reading at verse 12. And then um, uh, I would read a longer passage of the Scripture uh, that deals with the context, but I'll deal with the context itself in the sermon. So, Mark chapter 11. On the following day when they, that's referring to Jesus and his disciples, came from Bethany, he, meaning Jesus, was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Or some translations have it. His disciples were listening to him. They were paying attention to him. Because they realized that something rather uh, significant was going on here. This is a rather interesting passage, even though it's short, it's very interesting, it's very important. And, and one of the things I want to state at the very outset, and what makes this, this miracle of Jesus and the cursing of the fig tree significant, is that this is the only miracle of Jesus in his three-year ministry that is destructive by nature. Now you think about that, all the miracles of Jesus in his ministry, all those miracles leading up to this miracle were restorative in nature. Right? So if you know anything about the Bible and you're somewhat aware of the ministry of Jesus, you know that Jesus, as he said himself, came to bring life and give it abundantly. So we find Jesus' healing ministry in the Bible. He heals the blind, he heals the deaf, he heals the lame, he heals the mute, he heals the demon-possessed, he heals those who are actually dead, and he brings them back to life. All these miracles are restorative in nature. This is the only one that is destructive. He curses. He doesn't bless. 
He curses a fig tree, which seems strange to us and, of course, raises the question in the readers, I mean, what is, what is all about, this all about? What was the significance of that? We're going to get into that. But first, I want to begin with this. Um, kids, kids, I want you to listen up to me. Look up to me, if you would, because and, and, this is a passage for you, too, all right? And I want to ask you this question. What do you know about figs? What do you know about figs? Because Jesus curses a fig tree. You probably don't know much about figs. I don't even know if you've ever eaten figs. Because when we buy figs in the store, they're usually dried, right? And I'll get back to that in just a moment. But we don't find fig trees out here, do we? We find apple trees. We find cherry trees. We find all kinds of uh, fruit that we can pick. Blueberries and raspberries and bumbleberries and all that kind of thing. So this is, we live, of course, people know this in Canada. This is one of the most productive areas in all of Canada. So we have a lot of trees and a lot of fruit. But one thing that we don't have, we don't have fig trees. We don't raise figs. You have to go to the Middle East for that. You have to go into a desert region for that. So it's probably a fact that you, you don't know much about figs. You probably don't even know what they hardly look like, especially before they are dried. So at this point, A.V., would you put a couple of those up there? Kids, I want you to take a look. This is a couple of very quick visuals. Here we have a, this is a fig tree. And this is probably a tree very similar to what Jesus experienced. Notice we have a lamb there. This is rather interesting. Jesus, the Lamb of God. But here we have a fig tree, and fig trees were not only for, known for having figs, but providing shade, which is very important in desert regions. Go to the next one, if you would. This is what figs look like. It's a fruit on a tree, and this is what they look like before they are harvested and they are dried out. Just one more. And that's what it looks like in the inside. So a fig is a fruit, and the reason why we call it a fruit is because it has all kinds of seeds in it. And you see that it's all red, but once it dries out, it just kind of turns brown. Now, here's the thing about figs. And you can take that off there now, and we can go back to the Scripture passage. Here's the thing about figs. Figs, when they dry out, when you eat them, are very sweet, and they are very chewy, and they, also ha they are also very healthy for you. So figs are, are known for uh, aiding in digestion, for lowering blood pressure, which usually is... You know, kids don't have to worry about that normally, right? And then in addition to that, you have vitamins A and C and other health benefits of potassium, magnesium, iron, and calcium. All of that is packed into a little fig. So here's my point. When you consider a fig, figs really pack a punch. And what Jesus does is he draws our attention to figs and a fig tree in order to make this point. That when he looks from above and he looks here below and he looks into your life and my life, he wants to see a fig filled, not a fig free, but a fig filled life. He desires to see a very intimate connection between the faith that we profess in Jesus Christ, a very intimate connection between the gospel that is the good news of Jesus Christ and our appropriation of him that then translates into a life that is lived fruitfully for him. A genuine faith, an intimate faith, a kind of faith that brings glory to God, that brings joy to our lives and is attractive to the world. That's the kind of faith. And that's the kind of faith we see Jesus promoting here in this passage. So we want to take a look at the passage. So when we look at the passage, we see there's, there's a geographical matter that he brings out here that Jesus and his disciples are moving from one place to another. So they're moving from Bethany, and they're moving on to a place called Jerusalem, the capital. And on the way, as Jesus' disciples are moving along, we realize, according to that passage, that Jesus becomes hungry, and he's looking for food to eat. And he sees, now kids imagine that fig tree that was shown with that lamb underneath it, he sees a tree like that, and he goes up to the tree, and he's looking for figs so that he can eat the figs, because the figs will satisfy some of his appetite, and they're nutritious, and so forth. But when he goes to the tree, what does he find? He finds that the tree is full of green leaves. It looks like it's productive. It looks like it's promising, when in fact, when he goes up to the tree, he realizes that there's actually no figs in the tree. Mark tells us this in his account here. I don't know if you noticed that. It says that when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs, which raises the question, if it wasn't the season for figs, then why did Jesus go up to the tree expecting that there may be figs there? 
And the answer is because sometimes early on in the season, as the leaves emerge on the tree and as they become green, sometimes prematurely figs emerge. They come about on the tree. So Jesus goes up to the tree looking for the possibility of figs, but when he realizes that there are no figs, what does he do? He turns around and he pronounces a curse upon the tree, which, by the way, later on, if you have your Bibles open, you can take a look at verse 13, or no, excuse me, not verse 13, uh, verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree uh, withered away to its very roots. So when Jesus pronounces a curse, this is not a partial curse. This is a curse that is so profound and so deep-seated that it withers from the roots all the way on to the top. Total destruction. Which raises the question, why in the world did Jesus do this? Because it appears for some, oftentimes when I read the Bible, I think, okay, if someone was reading this passage the first time in their life and they're becoming acquainted with the Bible, what would they think about that? they probably think, this is not the Jesus I was told about. This doesn't seem to be a very nice Jesus. I mean, a curse of fig tree. I mean, what, what really is the point of that? Yeah, good question. And his disciples are probably wondering the same thing. Well, he does it in order to make a point with his disciples. To make a point. And it is a point that is reflected throughout the Bible. And that is, sometimes in the life of God's people... And certainly in the lives of people who are outside of Christ, sometimes there is the appearance of life when in fact, in reality, there's not a a lot of life to be had. Let me give you an example of that from the Old Covenant, from the Old Testament, because interesting what you find oftentimes in the ministry of Jesus is he's drawing upon imagery from the Old Testament. Let me give you one example. Um, PowerPoint team, can you, uh, or the AV, can you put that past? Isaiah 5. Take a look at this. We read this, let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. Beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, and he planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine, wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. For the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, he saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but behold, there was an outcry. So here's the idea that the Lord himself plants his people like a vineyard. If you know anything about the Bible, we read about this in the book of Deuteronomy. God says basically, I have chosen you among all the nations of the world. Of all the nations of the world, I have set my love upon you, not because you have deserved it, but because I am a God of good pleasure and I am a God of grace and I put my love upon you. So in a sense, the Lord gathers for himself a people, he plants them as a vineyard, and the expectation is is that this vineyard is going to yield grapes in time. And sure enough, all of a sudden you look at the vineyard and there's grapes there, but they're not cultivated grapes, they're not sweet grapes, they're not grapes that are tasty and they're not grapes that make fine wine. They produce grapes, but they're sour grapes. And Jesus' point is, is that there is a disconnect between your identity as my people and your profession of faith in me and actually the way that you live your lives. And in this case, there's a huge disconnect. He says, I look for justice among you, but what do I see? I see bloodshed. I look for righteousness. Behold, there's an outcry. In other words, the Lord says, you're to be a people for my own possession. You're to be a countercultural people. You are to be a light to the nations. But in reality, you're not living all that different from the world. The violence of the world is your violence. The hardness of heart of the world is your hardness of heart. Right? Now, there's other passages that we could go to in the Old Testament, but the point is is that Jesus is always kind of drawing upon this imagery and he's applying it to the people of his day. He's applying it to us today. Okay? And one other thing, before I get into a little bit of an a- application here at this point, um, Jesus draws upon the imagery of the Old Testament, but what we also see is that some of the things that the Lord faced in the Old Testament times, hundreds of years before, carried forward during the day of Jesus that tells us that the people of Israel, the people of God, were in need of renewal, and that's why Jesus and his disciples ministered to the people of their day. Let me give you an example of that. Go back to Mark chapter 11. 
where we find another disconnect between faith and life, between the leaves of the fig tree and the lack of the bearing of fruit. If you look at the Gospel of Matthew, there are two occurrences that get at the heart of this that lead up to the cursing of the fig tree. So uh, many of us are aware of what we call the triumphal entry of Jesus. This is where Jesus comes into Jerusalem. This is something that we celebrate on Palm Sunday where Jesus is on the foal of a donkey, the colt of a donkey, which is an animal of humility. And he is a great king. So there's there's a combination of a king who is sovereign, but at the same time is humble, unlike the kings of that day, especially Roman emperors. And Jesus is on this donkey, and he is is riding in this donkey into Jerusalem. and, And we find there's thousands of people in Jerusalem, and what are they doing? They are praising this Jesus. And why are they praising him? Because he, they think that he's going to be the kind of king that's going to free them actually from their Roman oppressors. Not transform them, not renew them as a covenant people of God and draw them to their Savior. No. He's going to be a, a physical, powerful king that's going to free them, redeem them from their oppressors. So they're, they're, they're like... They're praising his name. So how do they do that? Well, what they do is they wave palm branches in the air and they take off their cloaks or their coats and they put them on the ground so that Jesus comes, his colt walks on them, a sign of respect and praise for him. And, and they're crying out something. What are they crying out? They cry out, Hosanna! Hosanna, which means the one who saves, <laughs> the one who's going to redeem us. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Talk about a fig-filled people, right? And yet it's these very people who within one short week will be the very ones who will cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Don't crucify Barabbas, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. What do we find there? You find leaves without figs. Then after that, Jesus goes into the Jerusalem temple. And what does he find in the Jerusalem temple? Does he find a spiritual people? Does he find a faithful people? Does he find a, 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 a praying people? Because the temple's known as the house of prayer. No. He finds corrupt business practices among his own people. They have tainted the house of the Lord. And as if Jesus is saying to his people at this time, you know, you you say you know me. You say you praise me. I heard your praises coming into Jerusalem. You say that you go to the temple to worship, but I don't see it to pray, but to engage in corrupt business practices. Oh, I see all these things, all these religious activities. But you know what it is? It's leaves. It ain't fruit. It's just leaves. Now you 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 look at this. I, I think it's it's a it's a temptation for, for you and me. Oftentimes when we read the Bible and read things like this, especially that was going on in, in the Jewish people, whether it be in the Old Testament or the 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 days of Jesus, I think it's very easy for us to come away and think, Well, listen, I know I know I struggle with things. I am not perfect. But you know, there's, there's the degrees of depravity. At least I haven't sunk quite to this. I shouldn't say that, but I, you know, thing is, though, I, I don't think that I've quite come to the point of bloodshed or engaged in corrupt business practices or anything like this. But the Bible does say that all we, like sheep, have gone astray, and each and every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. So a passage like this is in, in, instructive for us. And really what it is, it's instructive for the entire church, isn't it? So, how do we deal with a passage like this? I think it's a very interesting passage. And I want us to think about North American Christianity. And I want us to think about Christians. And I want us to think about the church of Jesus Christ in Canada. You and I, oh, my friends, we are, we are, in a, we are dark times. And um, as a pastor, I like to think positively and hopefully. But I also like to think realistically. You know what's going on. And you know what our prime minister is promoting. And you know what those of parliament, not all of them, but many of them are promoting. And these are things that are being destructive to our culture. And as as Christians, I think we recognize that. We praise God for Christians in government. There are a few of them who stand up for principle. 
but there are many things that are very, very uh, concerning to us. And in some ways, the churches have capitulated, not only doctrinally, but they have capitulated just by this, by shutting their mouths. And even during the time of the Roman Empire, when Christians shut their mouths, they were usually left alone. But when they started opening their mouths and they started to live out their countercultural faith, it is there where they started to experience difficulties. What's going on in our church today? What kind of figless faith do we find in the church today? Let me give you some examples. And we see them, by the way, in the Bible. There's what I call a, a, a faith, a faith of uh, protocols and procedures which we need, but sometimes can overtake a faith of power. Sometimes you have churches that are very concerned about boundaries and dotting all the theological I's and the theolo uh, crossing the theological T's. They want all the boxes crossed. They want to do all the right things. On the outside, everything looks right. But what people realize is that when they examine that, there doesn't always seem a lot of grace and doesn't seem a lot of power. For instance, think of the Ephesian church that we read about in Revelation chapter 2 where they had all these things in place, all things that were right. They had doctrine, they were doctrinally committed, they had discipline, and they had the determination to keep moving forward in the midst of great persecution. And Jesus never knocks that. He says, good for you, good for you. However, though you have all these things right, there's something that's wrong. And he said, you know what he says? He says, you've lost your first love. You can have all your theological ducks in a row, and you can have all things dedicated to order and decorum, and yet lack grace, lack power, lack love. That's the point that Jesus makes. You have protocols without power. On the other hand, secondly, you can have the direct opposite. You can have a desire for power and experience of the Christian faith, however, without protocol or without balance and depth. There are many people today in the church who, who want this experience of the Lord and they want this emotional high in worship. They want to feel something of the Lord, which is not bad. It is not wrong. However, oftentimes it's at the expense of really digging deep into the doctrines of the faith and how they've been expressed in the history of the church. And they forego religious tradition. They want to feel, they want to become of a lively church, but what they do is oftentimes they leave behind all the traditions of the church. Now, sometimes the traditions are not great, sometimes they are good, but to discount all tradition and all historical practices just to become relevant is not a good thing either. You see what I'm doing is I'm talking about balance here. Though they're seeking subjective experiences of God at the expense of the objective hard work of study and doctrine, and in the end, this kind of faith oftentimes struggles with immaturity and staying power because it lacks a sturdy foundation. Right, so, you give me an example of that in the book of Revelation, where you find in Revelation chapter 3, in connection with the church of Sardis, not the Sardis we know, but another Sardis in a place called Asia Minor. And, and, and the Lord says this regarding the church of Sardis. He says, you know what? You have a reputation for being alive. He says, though, when I, when I observe you more closely, though, I realize that you are dead. There's no stability there. There's no firm foundation there. And the Lord, what does the Lord say? He says, you've got to repent. You, gotta repent. you see the two extremes? you got protocol without power. you got power and experience without protocol, without tradition, without depth. There's another form the Bible warns us against in regard to a figless faith. It's a faith that is characterized by maturity without humility. It's a faith that is generally self-confident and willing to argue the finer points of theology, but oftentimes it comes across proud and intimidating to those who have never been taught. So those who are new to the faith or have yet to come to faith, they just sense this is a group that thinks it knows it all. And boy, do they have their refined theology, but I can never get to that point because I just don't know that stuff. The Apostle Paul condemned the Pharisees about this kind of figless faith. He says this in Romans chapter 2. If you could put that on, please. Okay, Romans 2. Look at this. Jesus says, or the Apostle Paul says to the Jews of his day, you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and prove what is excellent because you've been instructed 
You are sure that you're a guide to the blind and a light to those who live in darkness. You then who teach others, do you teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who teach that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who boast in law and yet you dishonor God by breaking the law. As it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. It's like, oh yeah, you think you got it all together. And you think proudly so that you are going to be an instructor to the ignorant and you're going to give light to the blind and all of that. And yet, the very people who observe you see something. They see a disconnect between faith and life. They see abject hypocrisy. And where there's hypocrisy, where, where your faith, which is supposed to be humble, translates into pride. And when they see that disconnect, what they end up doing is they're drawing away from it. I don't want to be a part of this. And then the strong words the Apostle Paul says, the Lord's name is blasphemed because of you. It's more kind of an intellectualized faith. Finally, this, one final form of figless faith is a faith that is characterized by marriage without romance. What I mean by that is this. It's a faith for some in the church today that is rather contractual. Just like a marriage, where you know your contract with the Lord. Some people use the term covenant. You know you'll be a people of faith and obedience, and you know all of what's expected of you. But it never really goes much more beyond that. There's little experience, there's little faith, there's little love, there's, again, there's little power. It's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a marriage where, and this is easy to fall into, you know this in your own marriage, right? Where over time, as husband and wife, you end up becoming best friends rather than lovers. That, that's a default position for almost every marriage. So if you've been married 10, 20, 30 years, I mean, man, you wake up together, you spend the day together, you go to bed together, all of that stuff. And, and, and marriage can be rather contractual. Where, where you know you made the vows in your marriage, but quite frankly, if I may put it this way, there's not a whole lot happening in the bedroom. And the same thing can happen in the faith. Where there's not a lot of, you, you, you have the contract before you, but the thing is, is that there's not a lot of intimacy with Christ. And quite frankly, there's not always a lot of intimacy with the church. There's a divorce between owning Jesus and loving the church and really participating in the life of that body, Right? In the end, this kind of faith, again, that has lost its first love. Okay, you could go on and on with this, okay? And this is, the, this is the nature of the church, and maybe it's a struggle for some of us. Well, as you can gather from our text, Jesus doesn't turn a blind eye to this kind of figless faith. What does he do in connection with the tree? He actually curses the tree. He just, does not, he just doesn't say, um, may fruit never come from you again. No, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And then again in verse 20, we read that the tree withered away to its very roots. This is a complete curse. And, and what this is a reflection of is this. Jesus doesn't cur uh, curse a person at this point. He curses a tree, but the tree is an image of the people of God. And constantly, time and time again, we read in the Bible, both Old and New Covenant, that the Lord wants us to live out a humble faith, a living faith. He wants a deep, deep, intimate connection between faith and life. And when that is there and we commit ourselves to the Lord, albeit imperfectly, we all get that, but when we really in our heart of hearts want to commit ourselves to the Lord, what do we receive? We receive not curses, but we receive what is called the blessings of the covenant. And these are showered, it's the showered goodness of God that just comes upon us and just soaks into us like a gentle rain upon the soul. But when we do not, then what we find are the warnings of the Bible and the covenant curses of the Bible, and this is what we have going on in the people of our passage, right? So Jesus curses the fig tree, and then the last thing that Mark adds, and he could very easily add where Jesus says, no, may no one ever eat from you again, done, verse 15, and they came to Jerusalem. But no, Mark adds this, and his disciples heard it. <laughs> in other words, they were listening to Jesus. It's not like Jesus was talking and they were thinking about something else, or Jesus was talking and it went one ear and out the other. No, the Bible says they, they were observing this. They were listening to this. So I leave you with this, which I think the, the text demands of us. Okay, the disciples listened to Jesus. Dear reader or dear listener, are we listening? 
to Jesus. You know, our text consists of only three verses, but it doesn't mean that it's not important. Quite contrary, it's extremely important because it forces us to ask the question, where am I at with Jesus? Where am I at with Jesus? The Bible, as we draw to a close here, I, I, I want to say this. The Bible mentions only three types of people in the world. Do you know that? You have what are called the reprobate. These are individuals who, for whatever reason, have never drawn near to Christ. Maybe they weren't taught the things of God when they were younger. Or maybe they dabbled with Jesus, but in the end just didn't want the hassle of trying to follow him. Or didn't want the hassle of the church, or whatever. Um, the Bible calls individuals like this with, without God and without hope in the world. The reprobate. These are people who are characterized by no leaves, <laughs> no fruit. They're barren fig trees. All they got is branches. No, not even, they don't even have leaves. No leaves, no fruit. Then the second class of people are not the reprobate, but they're the ones who are the outward religious. That's who Jesus is addressing here. And the outwardly religious are those who have leaves, and they look alive, and they look really promising, but there's really not a whole lot of fruit, sometimes none at all. And then finally, you have the reprobate, you have the outward religious, and you have what are called the inwardly regenerate. And these are the people who have tasted of the goodness of the Lord and who have given their lives to Jesus and in service to him. And these are people who the Bible describes as those like a fig tree that not only has leaves, but also has fruit. So I leave you this. No matter who you are, no matter what your connection to Jesus at this point, no matter what your connection to this church, no matter what your background, Jesus' invitation is the same for all of us. What does he say? Come. <laughs> Come. It's so beautiful in the Bible. Jesus is never like this with sinners. Right? No, 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 you've crossed the line. Jesus' invitation is this. No matter where you're at, he says, come and drink of the fountain. Drink deeply and satisfy your thirst. Jesus says, listen, I, I don't want your religion. I don't want appearances. I don't want performance. I don't want your religiosity. What I want, what I want is you. I want you. I want you. The Apostle Paul puts it like this, and I'll leave you with this verse. The Apostle Paul says, I, and this is after his conversion to Christ, he says, I count all things but rubbish, but garbage, in order that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, that's significant what he's saying. He says, I have left all things and I count everything in my life but absolute garbage because it leaves me with no joy and no freedom. I count it all but garbage in order that I may know Jesus. And the word know there is not just know about him or be loosely associated with him from a distance. He says, I count all things but rubbish in order that I may know, truly know him, truly, experientially, intimately, and I count all things but garbage in order that I might experience the power of his resurrection. And this is not just the reality of the bodily resurrection to come, which is the promise that we have in Christ, but this is the power of the resurrection that invades our lives so that with the power with which Jesus was raised from the dead, by that very same power, we rise to new life, spiritual life in this life, which translates us beyond just a confession of faith to the living of a fig-filled faith before the Lord. The Lord says, that's what I want. That's what I want. And let's all give our hearts to that very thing that we may follow Jesus in the way that he desires and experience that together for the glory of God, for the joy of experiencing that together, and also as an attractive witness to this city, my friends, that is so, so in need of the gospel. Think about these things. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus. And sometimes, Lord, in the life of Jesus, we see things that just initially bring us joy and things that disturb us, like the cursing of this fig tree. But Lord, we pray that we may learn a lesson from this, all of us together. And that is to, as the Apostle Paul says, to examine ourselves daily, 
to, as the Apostle Peter puts it, to make our calling and election sure. Father, we pray that you will use this passage to reinvigorate us and renew us in the direction of Christ, that like the Apostle Paul, we may truly and in an ongoing fashion know him, love him, serve him, and experience the power of his resurrection in our lives. God, grant that, we pray, in increasing measure, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen.